Oh, we are at uh, chapter one, verse nine, testimony of St. John. Let's just stop. Surrounded by um, I could hear Alexa yeah. talking in my crown there. Um, does someone feel to off offer a morning prayer? I can pray. Thank you for one. Gracious on my father. Uh, we come to you from varying places and varying times. And you know that all things that are in my hands and we're grateful for the opportunity to come together to study for Eva's efforts, particularly for the spirit and the spirit of the comments that um, and we pray that they will open our hearts that we might glean everything that we are capable of understanding from the scriptures and pray that the Holy Spirit be upon us and that charity will inform everything that we do. And um, we pray that those that are not with us uh, have their needs met. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Melissa, we are, if you uh, didn't hear, we are on a uh, mental blank. Uh, testimony of St. John, uh, chapter one, verse nine. But uh, before we dive in, because I know uh, maybe Adam will be jumping on late. Oh, here's Paula. Good timing, Paula. Um, Fawn, thank you for that beautiful symbolism and your experience that you shared um, in our little chat group of the salt and and all of that i found that deeply symbolic it was there was a lot to the day but um including a little a lot of little things that i didn't you know type out but and um, it will probably just keep expanding as you think about it <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a cool experience I love how you expressed you saw the rainbow through the salt whirlwind kind yeah. of thing. Um, so like such beautiful symbols there of covenant and he can, you know, cause some of the salt to rise. That's beautiful. That's my hope for a lot of us. Well, and we've driven past them many, many, many times. Um, even since the salt's been there and I've never seen it do that. So mm -hmm. it, it did seem timely. <laughs> Especially because you were looking. Yeah. You wanted to go and look. And so I love that how that's another evidence of God speaking your language and speaking to you and knowing what what was in your heart. And then you recounting some of it back to us. It's yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. And like, whenever you say, I hope it's not too much, it's not too much. We <laughs> love the sharing. Thank you. And good morning, Paula. Good morning. Do you know, I uh, loved your question too, Paula, in our little group about Denver's ending comments. Um, and it looks like Matt's jumped on and said something too. Denver's ending comments about, uh, what did he say? I'm going to scroll back and look at your stuff. Um, yeah, he said. Joseph Smith's, yeah. Native cheer. Oh, sometimes I think having a native cheery temperament is not altogether a good thing. 
And then Matt shared how um, Joseph mentioned that he had a native cheery temperament. Um, Joseph Smith was a real clever, jovial boy. Um, and how I'm thinking of the be of good cheer talk. Um, to look for hope, to be of good cheer, to keep looking up and how Christ is one of the, um, I don't know, what was it? Christ is one of the most happiest beings. Uh, most cheerful, yeah. Cheerful. Cheerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then here we have Denver saying, well, you know, our native temperament, maybe, you know, um, it's not altogether a good thing. So I think his point, like based on his talk, my own opinions, what I got from it um, was that was a third knock. I think that was mentioned or that was, uh, or we've come to the point of a third knock and we're still being told about our hearts not being right and needing to connect and keep the covenant and, you know, when I look at the covenant on my door there, which actually Fawn pulled out all those things of the covenant and someone made it into that poster. Um, when I look at all those, it's how we treat each other, like be of good cheer, be tender with one another, um, do my works, labor with me, love one another, do not murmur, teach your children to honor me. You know, all those, it's relationship and connection and I think because we're at a third knock stage like we have to take things more sober-minded and seriously um are we like Joseph Smith are we like Christ who um have risen up um so that we can have you know just be jovial and natively cheery all the time or do we need to have a balance now of, yes, have, be hopeful, look up, be positive, but also be sober-minded and take this covenant seriously? Um, yeah, because we're at a third knock point. And if we miss the third knock um, and we're not seeing who is speaking to us or taking seriously and living it, we may forfeit an opportunity is what I got from it. What were some of your thoughts? I don't know. I couldn't wrap my head around what he was trying to say. So, it seemed that one of the points was like you're saying, Eva, that um, I mean, considering what he, what he, what he taught, what he said, because what he said was rereading the prayer for covenant and rereading and um, somewhat uh, paraphrasing the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew mm -hmm. and those two things being things that have been around you know they've been around uh, mm -hmm. the one for how many years now six five what are we at six years uh Almost yeah. Six. Mm -hmm. And I, Five I just, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other one for two centuries. And, uh, and so I guess it would be like being born into a family, a large family, like little Adam there is born into a bigger family, as I understand, right, Dan? And so he gets. The whole history of your family is his inheritance, even though he hasn't been there for a large portion of it to this point in his life. And same thing for us, right? And so I think acknowledging that we are part of this, of the family that desires the Lord. Um, and acknowledging that we have inherited all the mistakes of 
our forebears matters and mm -hmm. even in the answer for covenant where he's i think it's somewhere it says I, that it would have been a light thing um for you to do what i'd ask or whatever mm -hmm. and um I don't know. It takes this. I thought it was interesting because on Saturday or Friday, exactly what I did was go and read the prayer for covenant and the answer for covenant without realizing that was going to be a significant. I mean, I knew the answer for covenant was because they announced that, but I didn't realize that the prayer for covenant part was going to be significantly discussed and. I took things from it on Friday that I had not realized were there. One of them being uh, the point about the LDS people being the aggressors in Missouri. I didn't remember that or that hasn't been on my, you know, history. <laughs> and so how do we make amends for being those for that inheritance of aggression. If we don't count anything that's happened in the past six years, we still have to account for the aggression of the past. Mm -hmm. you know? And anyway, I don't know. Obviously we're all just sort of new to what was said, so. <laughs> it's just ranting. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Tina. Okay. I just have you on my earbuds, so I don't usually use them. <laughs> but I was telling Eva, I think it was you the other day about how I read this article that was put out by BYU a while back about the um, people in Utah uh, who've been here, you know, generationally, and how um, because of the past traumas, there's a lot of uh, oh, um protective responses and people are very you know to themselves quickly because they're protective of generationally protective which has been passed down because of all the terrible whole things that they went through you know and I think part of this is trying to get us out of that perspective needing to be defensive all the time does that make sense mm -hmm. I'm saying <laughs> And, you know, there's you know, the covenant here is trying to get us to open up again and get out of our generational traumas so that we can be more like Christ again instead of ready to fight. I hope that makes that is making sense. That yeah, so, so it was really interesting that it was a BYU article, someone's thesis that they wrote. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tina. You know, I looked up Native Cheery Temperament uh, on Denver's blog, and uh, in 2010, I found a post that I felt really reflected uh, the conference, actually, and that uh, aggression that came up on Saturday. Um, and in this post, it's called the, uh, it's called Trivial Pursuit. I won't read it all because it's a long post, but there was a part in here um, and it says, most of the stuff we concern ourselves with is meaningless and time-wasting. What matters are the principles and ordinances of the gospel and more important still, the underlying charity or pure love of Christ. Everything is attempting to get you to love your fellow man, not in the sap, sappy, sentimental way we associate with loving someone because sometimes the most charitable thing you can do is rebuke someone. As we see from Nephi, sometimes a sharp word comes from being moved upon by, uh, in the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Ghost. But in the end, the person rebuked should still feel they are loved and the reason for the rebuke was concern held for them. And he goes on uh, talking about um, 
the Lord's um, sense of humor and the Lord's, uh, the Lord was gregarious, but we've turned him into a caricature. Um, and he talks about the Lord's cheerfulness and the Lord's hope. Um, yeah, anyway, it, there's a lot in that post, so it might be good if you have time to reread that one for your pursuit. Hey, Adam, good morning. Good evening. How are you doing? Good, yeah, I'm great. Good to see you all. Good. All right, well, does, shall we jump into our study? Unless anyone has any other thoughts to share. <laughs> Actually, I read... I, I missed um, Denver's talk. I fell asleep uh, halfway through the second to last talk. So while I was waiting, telling myself, stay awake, stay awake. But I, I crashed out on my bed with the phone in my hand. So then I read the post on, uh, on his website and he spoke about so he said he, that cheerful temperament or whatever the line was that you just said, what, why did he say that? Was there something in his speech? It was an unusual comment. You know, it's not always best to have a cheerful. What, what did he say? But why did he say it? Was there something he said in his talk that uh, was reflecting of not having a cheerful temperament? I don't think it was the talk so much. The talk was essentially the prayer for covenant and the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew um, as the, with a significant change that I have to go back and look at um, in our, our e-scriptures. Um, I don't know otherwise. I wondered if it was, I don't know. So. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah. yeah, my thoughts were just like I shared before that um, it's coming to like a crunch time. This is like a something about a third knock. We're at the point of a third knock. Right. And yeah. if we haven't recognized who is speaking to us at this point, I, we need a balance, not only with the native cheery temperament, but somewhat soberness as well. And um, seriousness. And because it's coming to that point, third knock, right. um, it's either we move forward and succeed uh, towards Zion or it's left to um, another generation. And so Joseph Smith's native cheery temperament, I think also was, you know, part of his personality, but also he had received promises and assurances that he could have a native cheery temperament. Um, he had bona fide promises from God and he was redeemed. And Christ, well, Christ is Christ. <laughs> he has ascended, um, descended below all things and ascended and so he can be cheerful but I still find myself here still going Lord may may I be redeemed can you will you redeem me you know so it's not all just happy go lucky there needs to be a balance of seriousness and action on our part as well as being hopeful and seeing the beauty all around and God in all things Thanks. Any other comments? Go well, on. just reading it from the Just Smith history. I couldn't find this in RE, so this is from reading this from the LDS website. Um, this is where he is 
trying to find out his, Joseph Smith is trying to find out his standing before the Lord. And that's where that comes in. And he mm. says, um, I'll, I'll just read it real quick. Um, during the space of time, which intervening between the time I had the vision and the year 1823, having been forbidden to join any of the religious sects of the day and being of very tender years and persecuted by those who ought to have been my friends and to have treated me kindly. And if they supposed me to be deluded, to have endeavored in a proper and affectionate manner to have reclaimed me, I was left to all kinds of temptations and mingling with all kinds of society. I frequently fell into many foolish errors, displayed the weakness of youth and the foibles of human nature, which I am sorry to say, led me to diverse temptations, offensive in the sight of God. In making this confession, no one need suppose me uh, guilty of any great or malignant sins. A disposition to commit such was never in my nature. But I was guilty of levity, and sometimes associated with jovial company, not consistent with that character which ought to be maintained by one who was called of God, as I had been. But this will not seem very strange to anyone who recollects my youth and is acquainted with my native cheery temperament. He's sort of rebuking himself in, in a way and saying, well, I've been, you know, I've been subject to maybe not keeping things as serious as I ought. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean I've sinned greatly. But that I've, as Eva said, not maybe not taken things as as maybe I should. Yeah, because I think positivity and hope and joy and um, laughter is so important. Otherwise, we're all going to walk around with depression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we need to laugh. We need. There is beauty all around us. There is so much good in the world. Um, I think the lament of Joseph Smith is, and uh, while you were reading that, I was thinking of loud laughter. And uh, so some people have taken that to mean, well, you can't laugh a lot or laugh really loud and do your pig snort laugh and all of that. It's not that at all. It's taking lightly the things of God. Um, Being mocking. Mm-hmm. And also not taking it as serious, like, you know that scripture, maybe it's in Ezekiel, where they come before the Lord's messenger because they he, they say he plays an instrument well. They like the sound of his voice. They come and sit before him as he speaks, and um, they're like, wow, he plays that instrument well, but they don't go and do it. Was it explained the first and the second knock? Yeah. What? leading to this third knock yeah the condemnation of the um of the saints um i, I i'm not yeah i'm no history buff so but yeah it was that the lord gave them a promise and they took it lightly and then the lord gave them another chance and they became worse was the second and okay. the implication being that, you know, if if we were at the third, don't do better. <laughs> Not to be, I don't know. We definitely don't want to put ourselves back in the idea that you have to, have to, have to, must, must, must. Everything has to be perfect. Otherwise, it's actually the opposite. We don't have to regime ourselves. We just have to let go of all the crap. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and see what things are really important yeah. um, and what things we can just let go of, like you said. And even in our relationships, like going back to contention on Friday, on Saturday, maybe that contention, if we would just let go of some things that are not important anymore, then hearts wouldn't be broken. 
Because um, some things just really don't matter. <laughs> I mean, they do matter, but when we come together, um, being present in the moment rather than looking back is important. Well, if it matters to the other person, then you can, I don't know. We can allow that too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. But there's a way that we ought to love each other enough to communicate and hold space and um, listen. And because a lot of it, even if we don't agree with someone, humanity, a, a good part of humanity is just listening and hearing someone out um, and we don't have to retaliate or come down and, and preach to them what we're seeing it's not our beliefs it's the compelling that's the problem mm -hmm. we get to believe whatever we believe and every person gets to believe and have and hold their beliefs it's the compelling of one another that is the principle of unrighteousness from my perspective. Yeah, I agree. I think it's learning to see each other. What does it mean to see each other as precious? You know, if, if I say something that offends, can, can the other person say that actually bothers me? And then I stop and think about, okay, uh, you know, reflecting on that and saying, I, you know, apologizing or, you know, making it so, I don't know, coming to some understanding of each other's hearts and not wanting to offend, but just learning to apologize and forgive. How do we do that? <laughs> you know, it's... Apparently, that's uh, still a work in progress. You know, Paula, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about how I want to be aware of different people's stories and traumas and triggers, but keeping up with all of that and trying to, like, not hurt someone in their traumas and triggers is impossible for me to do. Like, I'll confess that now, so I'll probably might trigger someone or hurt them, but if... I can, if we are in relationship, hopefully people can see what my heart truly is and that I don't mean it. And there's a quote that Tina has on her whiteboard. It's from um, a dear friend that passed over recently, Chris Chandler. And uh, the quote from Chris is, it is better to be trusted than loved. Um, he was a big advocate for trust in his family. He, he talked a lot about that. He gave me a lot of good advice with our kids to, to, to focus on that. And I can totally see why, you know, one thing I, you know, one thing that, or some things that we've learned as parents and as a couple is the importance of not at, um, accusing and making sure that if you feel upset about something, is to go and ask questions and not make the assumption and get all riled up and angry and, you know, and because mm -hmm. oftentimes people don't mean to hurt you. And you just take the time to ask, well, why did you do this? Or why did you say this? And if that person is soft enough and cares about the relationship, they're going to take the time to talk to you about it you know but I've, I've had that experience with some people and it never it doesn't go well sometimes because their heart isn't in the right place and I think it's important to you know have our hearts where we're willing to be a little, but we, well Aaron and I call it being generous being generous with trust trusting that that person is really sincerely wanting to have a relationship with you and so trying not to assume the worst, you know, and then if it's really upsetting, just to talk to them and just say, hey, why, why, why did this happen? And then being okay and trustworthy of them when they give you an answer, um, 
and then you know self reflection. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> it is. Thank you. I just Adam, uh, baby Adam is is like smiling at the camera. He's so sweet, He's smiling at the screen. <laughs> I've got a beautiful smile. Okay. Um, Shall we jump to the text, uh, verse nine? Oh, good morning, Brian. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> How are you good. doing? Yeah, a little, just getting up. Just got mm -hmm. back from the conference. So. Okay, well, we, are, we have been spending this time reflecting on the conference and Denver's talk and uh, his little comment at the end of his post and that cheery disposition and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts um, your reflections on the conference and yeah there was um I think part of that is is he he kind of likes to joke about some things in it um there was a comment um a question asked in the Q&A um, and he kind of joked about um he mentioned Rob Adolfo and and I, I'm pretty sure there was, uh, I know that there's um, now, I don't know if you guys saw, but there's quite a bit of contention. Uh, Rob was very angry, uh, went after a few people uh, verbally, <laughs> that is, and was engaging, you know, and there's, there's a continued effort uh, among them. I think that will split off some people, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but I think he was kind of, trying to be jovial, he, he always is, is positive and wants to try to bring people together. And even a, a little joke that he was joking about being contentious was in mentioning Rob. He was trying to lighten things up, get people to come together, <laughs> you know. Um, he's always very optimistic <laughs> about bringing people together, kind of like God is, it's like even, uh, um, somebody asked Denver a question about uh, John C. Bennett. Why why was the revelations with John C. Bennett so positive at times, or or encouraging that he could have these blessings? And and Denver said, "Well, God knows what's going on in a person's life, but He also is always, if they turn from their ways, uh, and He's like with John C. Bennett, He's trying to tell him." If you turn from your ways, these are the blessings that you can have, you know, um, and even anyway, so, so Denver by nature is pretty optimistic, always wants to see the best in people. And there's a reason Stephanie's, I was watching Stephanie because during this talk and the Q and A, she doesn't like very much at all because that's where his personality comes out. He's, he likes a little lighter life. And he'll say comments sometimes that um, people don't always get. So that's just my thought. <laughs> you know, it's like watching the, this thing happen. He's a really kind person, you know, and, and kind of like me, there's no offense intended. But I know sometimes little comments can cause offense. And so I think he was talking about kind of how he likes to talk, likes to kind of joke. Yeah, with some situations and people, it doesn't go over well. So, I remember also he really likes to show his, at least I remember him saying this a few years ago, show his more human side so people don't take him so seriously. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, and I know I've heard Stephanie say the same thing. He really doesn't like it. Yeah, she was like, <laughs> I saw the look, but it was. I don't know. I mean, my heart goes out to him because he's, it's like our, our headlines. I mean, like Adam and Eve, Lehi, and all. These are all people that he knows and cares about. I mean, even the recent friends he lost, they were going a different ways. Doug, you can mention further back, Doug Main Hall, several, quite a few others. They all had, he works with everybody, hoping that even if they have some great, some issue they're going sideways on um just like god I, i've seen just loves us and wants us to get it you know so anyway my uh 
I'm feeling for him because it's like, in some ways, the things we argue over seem fairly fixable, you know. Um, but it's but if a person won't let go of their claim or beef, then then oftentimes these things can take a person and 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 others with them down a, a tough road. So, uh, so yeah, I think he was just. He's Stephanie, I think, protects him or tries to, doesn't want him. It knows how good he is and it, he takes stuff to heart. So, you know, and it's hard. You know, he wants to, you know, and I, I know I maybe I'm also kind of empathizing with him because I've, I've seen him. You know, I've been through my own things where I didn't, I was hoping it could just work out and thinking things were simple and. Because I, you know, and, you know, I'm always willing to to let things go, but others aren't quite the same. So that's the cloak of charity, or the <laughs> garment that was mentioned on Saturday, when well, yeah, Sunday, excuse me, that we need. So anyway, those are my. There's a few of my thoughts, but I think it was a beautiful a conference with like Alan and and Keith both because those are those are good guys you know and, and Alan and, and Keith both have um anyway good people so. thank you sorry Brian. I didn't interrupt yeah thank you because no we asked we wanted to hear your thoughts so thank you yeah thank you any other thoughts questions Okay, well, we are in a testimony of St. John, chapter 1, verse 9. Would someone like to read? Um, yeah, 9 to 12, perhaps. Um, I'll go ahead and read. Thanks, Paula. The next day, John beheld... Jesus coming to him and said to those who were with him, Behold the sacrificial lamb of God who will redeem from the fall of the creation. And John testified of him to the others saying, This is him I described before saying, After me will come a man who has progressed far beyond me, for he existed before me in heaven. I recognize him and testify to Israel that he is that prophet foretold by Moses to whom all must give heed. Therefore, I am here baptizing with water to prepare people for him. And John recounted when I baptized him, I saw the spirit descending from heaven in a sign of a dove and it abode upon him. I recognized him as God's son because God who sent me and commanded me to baptize to prepare people to hear him told me on the man you see the spirit descend in a sign of a dove and remain with him he will be the one sent to bestow the holy ghost i saw this happen and testify that he is the son of god the foregoing events happened in bethbara beyond jordan as john baptized there on the next day after on the next day after john stood beside two of his followers and noticing jesus as he walked nearby he said to the two others behold the sacrificial lamb of god and these two who had followed john when they heard that testimony followed after jesus then jesus turned and saw them following him and asked what do you want? They called him rabbi, which means acknowledged teacher. And it asked, how can we understand the truth in advance? He replied, all men move upward by gaining light. If you advance, you will learn to be like me. And these two went with him and were taught and were his companions through that day. For it was mid-afternoon. 
One of the two who heard the testimony of John and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon, Simon Peter's brother. That evening he went to his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. And he brought Peter to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You will be called Cephas, which is, by interpretation, a seer or a stone. And these men were fishermen, but they immediately left everything else behind to follow Jesus. Thank you, Paula. Any symbols, thoughts, questions jump out? One thing I noticed uh, before is because we were having that conversation about um, the Holy Spirit versus the Holy Ghost, and um, in the scriptures, at least the what fell upon Jesus is described as the spirit, as the spirit of God and as the Holy ghost in different um, places. So uh, it's, it's one of those things to remind us that we probably don't need to get hung up on the language there too much. Mm -hmm. Um the thoughts I had was the title um, of the Lord in verse 9 and also in verse 12, I think, um, the sacrificial lamb of God. Um, and, you know, like with these names, um, these titles, they, uh, is the word manifold, they have uh, different meanings um, different associations. Um, and so I looked up uh, sacrificial lamb because we talked about Mary and her little lamb and the lamb following um, his mother wherever she went and that she was the one to prepare the sacrificial lamb. And so I looked up um, and I found this in temple themes in Christian worship. And it says, the man figure in the book of Revelation is called the lamb. This wordplay that is characteristic of temple texts in Aramaic, the word young one or talia was used for both a lamb and a servant. And so servant can be substituted for lamb. The fact that the servant was represented in the sacrifice by a goat is not a problem. There was a theological reason for keeping the animal figure. However, since in the visionary tradition, which dealt with things on earth and in heaven, the characters had to be distinguished. All heavenly beings were called men and all mortals were called animals, clean or unclean, depending on whether or not they were enemies. Thus, Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats describes the judgment of mortals by the Son of Man and his angels. The lamb enthroned shows that humanity has been restored to heaven. So I really appreciated that. I see those symbols throughout scripture that Men are those who have been in the presence of God and have standing before God and stand on their own two feet, so to speak, and defend the gospel, teach the gospel. They are servants um, and that humankind or mortals are all uh, as a symbol of animals, which puts an interesting story on Noah's Ark. Um, and how the symbol of Christ being the lamb, is, it is so symbolic. There are so many um, understandings of that beautiful symbol, but one of them showing if um, Christ could come into mortality as an animal, as a lamb, a clean animal, and then arise to the throne of God. Like I thought that was a beautiful symbol 
for us to hold on to because Christ is saying, follow me, um, do thou likewise kind of thing. I've heard that before where like it goes animal, man, angel as, a, as an ascension theory. Yes. And one, one Christmas I was sitting on my couch looking at our nativity scene and how it was set up and how we had the animals on the outskirts and we had men in the middle and then we had angels above and how it showed those, they were all in the same place. All levels were all together um, worshiping Christ. So I thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I love that, Tina. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Because, you know, I've got notes here. I've got thoughts and I don't want to hear just my own voice. <laughs> where, where, where did that Ascension um, story come from? Was it Tina that you mentioned about um, animals? I'm, and I'm guessing you're talking about as a probation. There is a, in, in this idea, there is animals becoming humans in another sphere and then onto angels as they ascend and is that what the the idea was tina and you know where that's a that good question <laughs> i don't okay. remember the reference to that i i want to say it was either from it was from margaret barker's book somewhere but i also have taken several classes so the references are kind of jumbled but i can try yeah. to find that but the idea is not necessarily um literal but more symbolic you know yeah. you're you're you behave more like a, an animal like natural man until you can have more self-control you know and be more thoughtful of who you are and and it's like uh symbolic of that um maturing and becoming closer with god and as you do so you become um more like each each I guess level is another way of saying it I don't know if that makes sense but I can try to find that reference it might take me some time <laughs> yesterday in, that. in the uh, talk oh go ahead in the uh, in the talk uh he was talking about how Shem overcame the lion within <laughs> you know that Shem in order to become Melchizedek and he was kind of referencing some with the natural man too that there was a process of, of overcoming that urge, that tough kind of that fight urge, that other, even it's just, I, I think even when we see an injustice, we want to go fight, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and that's actually what I, I, I think is essential right now in, 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 in individuals and, in, and as a group that we can come, if, if we're able to overcome the lion, that against each other <laughs> you know that's when the lion shall lie down with the wolf or with the, you, know, and, you know i was just thinking of that but yeah somehow there's our natures if we because uh, he's even uh, i've heard a, a reference of like you know even if you know you have a snake among you saying somebody has a snake-like attribute i guess you know to bite if you don't stomp on a person's head it won't trigger the bite reflex, you know, so us learning not to trigger, not to be ourselves, give, give heed to that lower part of our nature. And then also learning each other's natures and not to trigger some of those responses. So. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Um, going to uh, this. Um, well, when Nathaniel, um, is it Nathaniel in verse 10? Let me just check. Um, well, he sees Peter, <laughs> uh, and we know that story of you will be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a seer. Um, I learned that, um, that what he's referring to is the stone of seership. It's seership or the rock that uh, Christ builds his church on. 
And the Book of Mormon is a year of Thummim. It is a stone of judgment. Um, in uh, Joseph Smith's brother Hiram was told, wait till you receive my word. Oh, let me just let Julia in. My word, my rock, my church, and my gospel. There's four things there. And so word is the more sure word of prophecy or the testimony of Jesus told by, by the voice of God from heaven that they have eternal life. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The rock, which is what is uh, alluded to here, is that stone of seership. The church is um, the doctrine of Christ and peoplehood. It's a new family, a covenant family. It's not just belief, but it references what covenants one has assumed and that each is in direct contact with God. And the gospel is the first principles and ordinances, but not just faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost. It's um, what Joseph Smith was teaching in King Follett and in lectures on faith. It's the first principles of the gospel, the right of first ascent, the promise of a house or a mansion, the doctrines of resurrection of the dead and eternal life, um, the progression of men into gods, um, they're the fundamental articles of faith. So I think that's what is being alluded to in, um, when he calls Peter a seer, um, a rock, a stone. which, yeah, just a connection to the restoration and uh, the prophet Joseph Smith and uh, how he was focusing on in his later ministry those further principles of the gospel. And he taught he was teaching those to um, the members specifically, not the unconverted and the untaught because there's water, wine, and milk, right? Different levels. Um, any other comments? We could um, go on to 13 and 14. Because 13 and 14 is really interesting too. It's a lot of symbolism, with Nathaniel and the fig tree. If someone wants to read. I can read. <laughs> I can read if you want. <laughs> sure, Paula, go ahead. Sorry, I can try to find that reference. So I'm kind of focused on that. Oh, which reference is Tina? The one about animal, man, angel. I might have to oh. uh, message someone to get that, but yeah. Okay. The day following Jesus went to Galilee and encountered Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was at Bethsaida, the residence also of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found the prophet that Moses foretold in the law and who the prophets promised would come, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael asked him, can the promised Messiah come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to meet him and said of him, behold, a pure Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael asked him, how do you know anything about me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were praying under the fig tree, I heard your prayer. Nathanael responded, Rabbi, you must be the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, you believe in me because I said to you that I heard your prayer under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, in the name of Father Amen, 
I promise you, hereafter, you shall see the fiery ascent to heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending to visit the Son of Man. Thank you. Thoughts? So, that. No, I was just astounded, I guess. Not astounded, but for these people, they must have been just so wanting to find the Messiah or have the Messiah come and to be able to have that witness so readily. Some of these men just, uh, when John testified, they were able to accept this is, this is the one we're looking for. This is the one that's been prophesied. It just, uh, I don't know, just and can't explain what that. There's a lot of faith there for sure. Right. And still they had this understanding of Messiah in the Jewish understanding was this warrior who would come and fight their battles for them and establish them in their land and put down all their enemies. And then Christ comes kneeling and washing feet and um, associating himself with harlots and tax collectors and the diseased. And um, so still, even in that, the excitement of them, like, this is the Messiah, finally our people, you know. They're going to mm -hmm. get out under the Roman rule, you know, that... <laughs> That expectation yeah so, like i'm thinking how you how you said paul like how mind-boggling to think you know this expectation that the jewish nation had of this messiah and then it ends up that he's on a cross and he's crucified and put in a tomb what and then you have the road to emmaus and mm -hmm. um, they're discussing this should or not this have been you know <laughs> i think that relates to uh, um, I've seen a pattern lately. I've been pondering upon people that I've gotten really close to at times, and then, and also, then other times it's like they and they kind of put you up on a, a little bit of a pedestal or something, an idol. But then, if you don't live up to something, you say something, do something that they think that you ought not to be doing. You know, kind of like jo uh, Joseph was too jovial to whatever <laughs> you know joseph smith you know it was like oh we, they have these images of what their idols should be like and, and like you said it's like if if your idol doesn't live up to what you want eventually a, a people will put them up on a cross <laughs> or they crucify them <laughs> you know it's like they swing from uh, kind of this adulation uh to then <laughs> on the opposite side let's uh, let's get rid of them and and they're the most e you know evil thing on the planet and, and so i think it's wisdom not to there was a talk on heroes and bad guys you don't want to be the hero because if you're the hero one day you will also be the the goat so to speak so you know. yeah thank you brian um go ahead you go ahead <laughs> No, no, you go ahead. I talk too much. Okay. Um, in verse 14, I saw several types. Um, so Manuel, uh, Nathaniel asked him, can the promised Messiah come from Nazareth? And um, it occurred to me that Philip didn't say, I just told you he did, you know, you should just believe me. He, instead, he said, come and see, come and see for yourself. And that that's um, a type how those who have witnessed the Lord should be with others. Um, I hate the word should, but anyway, um, can be with others. That instead of just being like, I told you, I saw the Lord, just you should just accept that. Then they invited him to come and see for himself. 
And the second type that I saw in there was that um, Jesus knew Nathaniel before Nathaniel knew Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, somewhere, uh, I can look it up real quick, but it says about the Lord being always in our midst. And um, this is kind of a mini account, a mini proof of that, that Jesus saw Nathaniel praying before Nathaniel ever was in the presence of the Lord. And then um, and then the third type is, uh, I think this is still verse 4, right? Or 14. Mm -hmm. um, Lord says, in the name of Father Amen, I promise you, hereafter you shall see the fiery ascent to heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending to visit the son of man and so of course the promise that you will be able to see even to heaven um and also the words to visit because sometimes in the scriptures it says that people are visited with the holy ghost um as opposed to the, that the Holy Ghost will cut and dwell with them continually. Um, and then the only other point I was just going to make was um, most theologians believe that Nathaniel is also Bartholomew. Mm -hmm. Bartholomew was one of the 12 apostles. Yeah. And he's one of the um, ones that... Um, I think I read was present after Christ's resurrection when Christ um, appeared to them as they were fishing on the waters. Um, he was there. And so he saw in, you know, also that ascent um, as Christ came among them and was cooking fish on the, on the shore. And that is uh, referenced to also at the end of the testimony of St. John that really mystical part um, that we have at the end. But thank you uh, for what I really like and appreciate those types. I didn't see those types there, appreciate it. What I saw in verse 14, um, to also add to what you're saying, was um, the fig tree is a, is a symbol of the nation of Israel. And um, when we think of Nathaniel praying under the fig tree, well, if we go back to the temple and how Adam and Eve, well, the adversary tells Adam and Eve, quick, make an apron of fig leaves and cover yourselves. It's a, um, I mean, there's so many symbols. One symbol that stands out to me is fig leaves are like covering of sin. It's sin. Um, and so if um, at that point the nation of Israel um, had gone astray and Christ was among them, and then we have Nathaniel who his faith, he's standing under the fig tree, under the covenant of the nation of Israel, and he's praying to God potentially um, to I don't know, forgiveness of sins or, um, and so he has an experience under that fig tree that is only known between him and God. And so then when Christ says, um, I saw you praying under the fig tree, I heard your prayer. Nathaniel, um, based on his experience, recognizes that he must be the son of God, the king of Israel, um, to restore the covenant. Um, and I learned that Israel means one who sees God, which is an interesting tie there too, because Nathaniel testifies, you must be the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then later on, the Lord tells him, I promise you, you shall see the fiery ascent. So some interesting ties there. Um, 
and if by covenant we can become Israel, um, then it, that name Israel puts a duty on us or an obligation to align our lives um, to the covenant so that we can claim that title of one who sees God or Israel. I have a question. <clears throat> one of the innovations of this text say over the um the biblical version with where a lot of these stories occur is the title that christ constantly uses here of um referring to uh god the father as father amen mm -hmm. um what why Does anybody have an opinion on why this title was used uh, so much compared to, you know, it j just using the the terms that were more uh, familiar in in the New Testament? Good question. I um, mind, assume revelation. Yeah. My mind just goes to Joseph Smith. Was it Joseph Smith that talked about um, Father Armon, Son Armon, and um, angels as was an Anglo man or something like that? And um, I just think it's bringing a distinction that Christ is on his on the errand of his father. I guess in um, there are so many understandings of the Godhead and um, that can be really confusing. I, I'm actually not sure. I'm just, uh, for me, it makes it clear that there are separate beings. And if you see Christ, you see the father and um, Christ isn't on his own errand. Um, these are the commandments of the Father. Um, and whatever Christ speaks in the name of the Father is what the Father told him to speak. It just, it brings to me like a distinction, but I'm not too sure. Um, yeah. You know, looking under the names of, under the names uh, in the glossary of terms, you know, um, Father Amen, just being another term for God the Father. I was trying to look up something else. I'm trying I, to. I, th I think, yeah, I think it's Genesis comes from. I don't mean Genesis, but it's its origin comes from um, Book of Moses, Moses five or six, where it's used a bit in reference to. Uh, holy God, or it, 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 yeah, it, it has a, um, a a meaning. But I've noticed that you know it's. I, I guess what I've noticed is that we've got this. If I've remembered right, a book of Abraham kind of reference that I don't even know if it occurs in the New Testament or, at all, but it. It is the term that Jesus uses repetitively um, in this record. And I, I just wondered whether anybody had any thoughts on, yeah, why that title, if there was something, something more to it. I would, uh, if no one has any other comments, I would uh, like to read something. Um, so Christ's teachings will provide you with more than just resurrection. He will provide the further possibility of glory to you on the conditions he has made possible through obedience to him. The one you follow, whose teachings you accept, whose ordinances you accept, 
is also your father. The role of the father is to raise his seed in righteousness. Christ's teachings are given in his capacity of a father to all who will follow him. Through his teachings, you can have a new life here and now. You can be born again as his seed. To do that, you must first accept his role as your father and guide. Then you must further accept his role as father redeemer. When you do that, he gives you a new life by his teachings and new life by his ordinances. Here, we find ourselves excluded from the presence of heavenly father, Amen. We have no way back except through Christ. Um, for the name Amen, see Doctrine and Covenants 7820, where Christ mentions his father's name. He must become our father to bring us back again into the Amen's presence. Christ visits here, Christ labored here, lived among us, ministers still among us, and though resurrected, still walked alongside two of his disciples. He appeared in an upper room, cooked and ate fish on the lake shore, and appeared to many. He will come to dwell here again. The Father Amen, however, only appears in a state of glory, has not stood here since the fall of Adam, and awaits the completion of the work of Christ before he will again take up his abode here. Christ is not the same person as Father Amen. Christ becomes the father of all who are redeemed through him. Therefore, by redeeming you, Christ has become your father in heaven. You will have many fathers, including Christ, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and in our dispensation, Joseph Smith as well. And then I would say in our dispensation, uh, Denver Snuffer as well. And all these will also be the children of Father Armin. That was from uh, 2012, um, uh, Ether's reference to Christ as Father. Any other thoughts? I'm going to just put that reference so that it's there <laughs> about uh, the Lord saying that he's in our midst. But behold, verily, verily, I say unto you that my eyes are upon you. I am in your midst and you cannot see me. But the day soon comes that you shall see me and know that I am. For the veil of darkness shall soon be rent, and he that is not purified shall not abide the day. Thank you, Fawn. And what was uh, what stood out to you in there? So just thinking about how the Lord is the Lord is with us all the time, and um, it's something that. It's a little bit hard to wrap our mind around, perhaps. Um, there's um, another one. Uh, this is not, this is, this is just me. Um, he said, I can see you, though you cannot see me. I am not as far as you sometimes believe. Were you to see beyond the veil at this time, you would know that I am always before you. And I think this is another um, account of that, saying something similar. Thank you. Yeah. I'm I have a, oh, sorry. Go yeah. ahead. There you go. I was going to say, I have it written down in one of my classes I took um, where we talked about the four great gods, right? The Father Amen. And Hathor, her, his consort, that's from Egypt. That's from the Egyptian 
and Hathor's mother, sacred cow wisdom, Father Amun is the one hidden in the deep. And then Hebrew, the Hebrew translation would be El Elyon and Asherah. Um, so those are the, you know, the mother, father, and then there's Horus and Isis as Christ and his consort. And then their um, Hebrew translations would be Yahweh and Asherah. So I think some of that is the Hebrew part, I think is from the Margaret Barker, but the Greek part from uh, probably written for, out from uh, Hugh Nibley, I'm assuming, but maybe that can give you a little bit more insight. It's just like another title in a different, from a different language, you know, um, Ra Amen. Um, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> I have the Greek over here, but I didn't fill it all out. So I, I can't give you those translations as well, but um, I think that's kind of where that comes from maybe. And I, and I believe, I remember reading Nibley talking about, you know, Amen as well. So um, I, like I said, I think they're just different names and different languages, different um, titles different meanings behind each of the names um mcconkey our, our old friend um yeah it's, it's i don't know if it's a, a name people are gonna throw rotten fruit at me for saying but um mcconkey connects Armin as um pure language from the language of adam um and I think called you know says it has the may have the meaning of man of holiness. I'm just reading an article here, so it might but, just be. Oh. Go ahead. I just you know this idea that it might be Adamic. I agree with that actually. So yeah. no rotten fruit from me. <laughs> Not from me either. <laughs> <laughs> because Adam on die almond. So, yep. Um, man, well, the presence of God. And you know, Joseph Smith was had all those. I mean, he did some uh, research of of the Egyptian stuff. You know that he that's where the. Sorry, my brain. I'm like thinking of three things at once. So, <laughs> but <laughs> cute Tim in the background. Um, but he's got a lot of information from some of those Egyptian texts he has. So I'm sure that was another reason why that name comes up. Just another thought, but yeah. And I love that you brought up the Egyptian understanding as well, because I've really been uh, learning about that too. And all these titles and forms and functions that come with the titles, it's all truth. Like, I guess we get confused when we hear, you know, those names that we're not familiar with, but these stories that have been even from ancient Egypt, it's all, it's truth. <laughs> um, these stories throughout the cultures and different religions and different uh, names, it's the same themes repeating over and over again, Christ and ascension and redemption and, um, yeah, it's beautiful. Sometimes it can be mind boggling. <laughs> sorry, Paula. No, sorry. I was just looking through Denver's blog posts. He did one in December 2015 called Adam's Religion. And just kind of reading oh. through what he posted that day, he also talks about Amun and the Egyptian names and so on and so forth. If you ever want to look that one up, you can maybe read through that and find some information as well. So I will. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> I'm writing that down now. Let's go back and look there. I think um, I think as we as we hear these different names and as we see, you know a different name used in scripture, I think it can help us be um, more open-minded about, about God and about who he is because 
we tend to get um, kind of bogged down in the ideas or teachings that we've had and kind of box God in from those ideas. And so hearing him referenced in a different way, um, at least for me, can help me um, let go of some of those ideas and be more open-minded about who is God and, um, what, you know, what kind of being is he and, and kind of let go of, let go of some of those ideas and just be more open to, um, to whatever he wants to tell me, you know, about himself through, through hearing it referenced in an unfamiliar way. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah. I agree, Diane. Like, even with that name, the sacrificial lamb of God, like how we talked about like lamb, like how symbolic that is. And it just adds another depth and layer to Christ and his work, his eternal work, or the God's eternal work. Um, and brings it more personal too if we find ourselves here as animals and um, whether we're a sheep or a goat, I don't know. Just, yeah, I love the dimension it adds. So feels perfect. Go ahead, Paula. I, I was just noting that when that name comes up, Christ is proclaiming in the name of Father Adam, Amen. So if if he is using that name in reference to even the Adamic language, that to me signifies something. He's reverencing his father in, in the pure language. Does that make sense? And essentially, Christ is a new Adam. Right. Right. So, you know, I. I was thinking, how many times in the testimony of St. John does he proclaim something in the name of Father? Amen. I don't know. I haven't counted, but I'm just thinking, uh, to me, that seems something. He's not there for himself, but he's calling up. He's coming in the name of the Father, the Father, Amen. The, the language that we should know from before. The, I don't know. Something speaks of something, it's speaking of something more holy to me. I don't know why. Thank so, you. Um, Diane, your baby is really cute. I keep getting distracted by that smile. <laughs> Julia, did you have any thoughts? And welcome. Mm, not sure she can hear. Thank you. I can hear. I just need to be on mute and I'm enjoying listening this morning. Thank you. It's good to so have you. And so grateful that you're all here. Thank you. All right. Well, um, if no one has any other thoughts to add, we could probably have a prayer and get on with our day. Can I say something? Please. Okay. So, Hi. My name is Aaron Kibbe. I'm, I'm the lucky husband of Tina. Um, something that you have to remember about names is that they're like a, con a contractual signing. So when you say something like in the name of, you're acting in the stead of. It's kind of like power of attorney. So when you say, hear someone say, in the name of Jesus Christ, typically they're saying that, <clears throat> I'm saying that this is something that I'm uh, feeling is that we need to say to Jesus Christ. In the name of Father Amen, that's stepping it up a bit because he, Jesus Christ can't even do the things unless he's seen the Father do them. So when you say, in the name of Father Amen, or someone says, in the name of Father Amen, they're extending a covenant to you or a, contra a contract to you, wherein... Um, fairness is is applied um and since he and since he's um is always fair with his contracts 
it's giving you an assurance that at the end of the said thing uh, or the thing that was said before in the name of Father Amen, or the thing that's said directly after in the name of Father Amen, is is a offered agreement. So, pay attention to the um, the the contractual obligation on your side as well as the contractual obligation on his side. And if you place your faith into it and you push it and you and you put your actions to your faith, then you can expect the reward of that thing. Why Amen? Because it why amen is because it's to say, I am making a deal with you. Well, it's because there's a lot of fathers. There's a whole bunch of fathers, but this is a specific one who has power to be able to make an agreement. Wow, Aaron, thank you. That was like really, really good. Okay. Right. I gotta go back yeah, to making I appreciate bacon. that understanding. Thank you. That really resonates. Mm -hmm. yeah. You should jump on more often with us. <laughs> All right, would someone like to offer a prayer? You know, we don't have to do morning, I mean, like opening and closing prayers. I just like to pray and I love God involved, but sometimes we can, even if we want, keep it open till the next day. I don't mind. <laughs> Um, there's no whatever if prayers are I think much. it's appropriate but okay. I could say I it again say. if you want <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray for one. <laughs> Heavenly Father we are grateful for this opportunity to come together and uh, talk about conference and and jump in the scriptures and and study and we are grateful to have our minds open to thoughts that we may not have um, and ideas that we may not have seen before and we ask that we may understand the words that we have read according to your own heart in the intention and the meaning. And as Aaron has shared about the contract and speaking in the name of the Father, the covenant, we hope to have the faith and the belief to move forward in that, to receive the blessing offered, that we may become servants and labor in your vineyard we ask, Father, that as we go about our day, that the spirit of truth may um, press into us um, these scriptures and open it up even further, how it can apply in each of our lives personally. And we pray, Father, for your spirit to be with each of us and each person upon our prayer list. And also that you will show to us individually rather than asking you for all things, but how we can also bless and serve each other, what you would have us do for each other, to lift each other's burdens, to walk with each other, to comfort, to become harmless, to become precious. And we say this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Eva. Yeah, thank you all for jumping on. I'm happy to see you all. I love you all. Adam, you. hope you have a really good sleep. <laughs> thank you. Yes, all right, have a great day, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.